Okay, we are back live here at VMworld 2012. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dave Vellante, the founder of Wikibon.org, the premier and number one market research firm that offers free content on all surveys, and obviously SiliconAngle's free banner, banner advertising free. Uh, and I'm joined with uh, Rick uh, Jackson, CMO of uh, VMware, you put on the show. Welcome to theCUBE again. Oh, thank you, third uh, year. So first, thank you for having uh, SiliconANGLE for the third year. We really appreciate your hospitality and uh, a gesture with a great stage here. It gets bigger every year. There was one tweet, that the Cube gets bigger every year. And uh, <laughs> I want to thank you for that and, uh, and say thanks. So welcome, welcome back. So quick update, just run the numbers on uh, VMworld. The keynote here talked about the growth of obviously the marketplace, but they were talking about some stats. Talk about the whole concept of VMworld. What's changed from like this year, last year? Sure, you bet. It, it, you know, it just amazes us every year is that VMworld just really becomes that place where so many different disciplines come together to talk about what's going on in technology in the data center. So you've got you know, the server admins, the storage admins, the network admins, everybody's coming together and talking about what does it mean to operate in this new era where it's, it's not about the silos and the separate disciplines, but how does it all come together to serve the business? And I think that's why we just continue to see such strong growth in the show itself, is because the, the topics are starting to blend, and so you're bringing more of an audience towards that. So we're at over 20,000 as of uh, early this morning, and I'm sure it'll continue to grow throughout the week. You still have your voice, so it's early in the show. I know you're going to be doing a lot of glad handing and, uh, and PR uh, appearances all through all the parties, and there's a whole night activities. I mean, VMworld is a huge, it's huge a community. Job. It's great, uh, <laughs> it's vibrant. Um, but I want to ask you about something uh, a little bit more, more serious. That's Paul Moritz. Obviously, um, on Twitter, he's called The King. Really well regarded in the tech community. Um, he has yet to be on theCUBE, so we have to get him on theCUBE somehow. Uh, Paul, if you're watching, come on theCUBE. Um, but he's really well regarded in the technical circles. Obviously, he's handing over the reins to Pat Gelsinger, um, who knows a thing or two. Uh, he's going to move into a more of a corp dev, uh, biz dev, with Joe Tucci at EMC, mm -hmm. um, and really get down and dirty and kind of getting ready to paint the next canvas, if you will. Um, so what's it like for you? You got to kind of, you got to put the story together, keep the story going, uh, build on the massive growth. So as a marketing executive, you get the tiger by the tail on one end, the market's exploding. Yep. Same time, VMware is changing. Yeah. What's your, how do you handle that and what's your vision? Yeah, well I think it's a, it's a natural evolution of the company. If you think back four years when Paul was brought in, the role that Paul played was really to take a look at you know, what the company had done in the first decade around virtualization and where can you go with that? And there's just no doubt in my mind that Paul is one of the great technology minds of our era and just understands technology, what you could do with technology and strategy around technology like nobody else. And he really put us on a path for just accelerated growth. Now we're, as we're evolving, you know, when he took over the company, we were less than two billion in revenue. We're a much bigger company than that. Now you've got all the operational aspects that need to come into play as well. And really think about every single gear in the system has got to be running at full speed. Take a guy like Pat Gelsinger, who's got an incredible technology background. So he understands and appreciates the technology the way Paul did, but who also spent over 30 years at Intel running a pretty major part of Intel with the x86 product line and all. So he gets the whole operational picture of what needs to happen and all the things that need to come together. So it's the natural evolution of our growth. You know, I've been a big proponent of, at the CEO level, this modern era as we're calling it, CEOs really need to have technical chops. And you're seeing that in the startup landscape, uh, the disruption in venture capital, for example, Andreessen Horowitz and still here in Silicon Valley is dominant because Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz are, are tech geeks running yep. a huge fund, and um, this alpha geek mentality even goes to the top, so I think one, that's a good call for you guys. Uh, the, other, the other question I want to ask you is, um, relative to the other big companies, and you know, the, the incumbents, the IBMs, the HPs, and I know you're partnering with them, but um, they're bigger and a little bit slower, you guys are still growing, still nimble. Paul talks about abstract, pool, and automate, which is code words for operating system. And he's laid out that chart in 2010 that we were commenting even back then that it smells like Wintel of the future, it's an operating system. Um, you guys are kind of building this operating system that, that now has cloud, a big part of that multiple cloud future of the data center. Um, so talk about that uh, relative to VMware, and specifically how Flash 
and solid state has changed. I saw you talking with, with uh, Scott with Pure Storage, you yep. know, and good and, friend. And it's, it's it's guys like like uh, Scott's company and others that are just changing the game. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's no secret that that Paul is often referred to what we do as the cloud operating system, the virtual data center operating system. Software so mainframe. Yeah. Software yeah. mainframe. Yeah. Yeah. So these, these I hate that. I hate successfully that killed that term. <laughs> yeah, yeah, All good, terms good that job. he's very comfortable with, and uh, yeah. and we try and kind of keep them somewhat boxed. But yeah, the the reality is is that what we're able to to do, and especially with our vision of the software defined data center, is to be able to take standard x86 based hardware and really begin to throw any challenge at it. And, and that's the whole notion of automate pool, or excuse me, abstract pool automate is we want to get all of the complex technology at a point where it can be delivered dynamically as a service so that any and all workloads can take advantage of it when they need to. When you introduce new technologies like flash and they, uh, uh, how much flash we're seeing moving into the storage world and how quickly, we want to be able to take advantage of that capability, but if everything is hardwired down to the physical storage devices, then it's going to take uh, so much more work and effort to be able to implement and integrate new technologies into the data center. This is one of the value propositions of the software-defined data center. Everything is running at an abstracted layer, everything. Everything is a service in the data center, so we can implement new technologies underneath, new physical hardware, yeah. and get immediate benefit from that through the software. He talks, he talks about that hardened top or under the hood like a car, right? The dashboard is, uh, is what you really want. Uh, we were showing you a quick preview of our VDP finder kind of vertical uh, engine, social data earlier before you came on. And, but it's things like real-time dashboards that businesses are going to be running on. And, and obviously we're a big believer that instrumentation of that is, is key for businesses. You guys are enabling that. How has the real-time um, effort change some of your thinking. We saw SAP announcing that heavily with mobile. Yep. You know, the, having a, a Nexus or an iPad is really changing the, the end user experience. Can Absolutely. you talk about how you guys are attacking, because your, your end user computing message is constantly morphing with the marketplace. Right, right, and, and we're just, we're trying to usher in that post PC era and make it so that it's easy for everybody and anybody to access apps, data, whatever it is, whatever you need from any device. But I think if you, if you look at what the business demands, what end users demand, and the underlying infrastructure technology, it all grows together, right? As more and more demands come up, we create new ways of delivering technology and services to support that demand. And that equation has never stopped. Uh, I'll never forget a good friend of mine once said that, you know, we always thought that we'd run out of need for memory on our laptops. At some point, how much do you really need, you know, two gigabytes, four gigabytes of, of memory on a laptop? Well, every time you add more memory, you find new applications that take up more memory, new ways of using compute power. And that's what's happening in the data center. You talk about big data. We've had this, uh, these ideas of big data for a long time in marketing. And by the way, marketing is still one of the heaviest users of big data in the industry, because that's how we think. We yeah, think about large volumes of data and interactions, behavior, market how do you segment, et cetera, market intelligence. Yeah. Our problem has always been that to, to be able to do that in a traditional physical or client server world, you had to go procure so much hardware just to be able to start a project that no one would sign the budget. But one of the things we showed uh, this morning in, in the <laughs> keynote with, with uh, Steve Harrod is, Thank what you. if we could take all the unused compute at night and turn it into one big server farm to do my analysis data for me? So when I come in the next morning, I have all kinds of market intelligence right at my fingertips. Well, it's one, getting the budget approved, one, and then when you build it, you got to get a schema, it's a data warehouse, and then it takes weeks to get the report. By that time, the yeah. business has changed. It's changed. Well, it's interesting now it's to see the, um, the messaging around Hadoop. Right, so this is another potential silo. You guys are trying to get your arms around that and make sure it doesn't get too out of control. Um, talk about that a little bit. I mean, Pat talked about this museum of you know, legacy infrastructure, and then yeah. now all of a sudden you have this freight train you know, called big data coming at you. Yeah. And, and as, as uh, 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 Steve said this morning, a lot of people didn't initially think of virtualization and big data as going hand in hand. It's exactly. It's the natural decision making that we've gone through for decades as new application type that requires a new stack. And so we go off and we start piloting a new vertical silo that gets plugged into the data center. Now I've got more complexity, more silos to manage, 
We don't need to do that anymore. We have reached a point where we no longer need to create new silos for new application types. The, the advances that we've had in x86 hardware, the advances we've had in the virtualization space, both bet between VMware and the ecosystem of partners that are extending the, the technology with their technology, we don't need separate platforms for every app. So one of the virtues of the software-defined data center is that it's homogenous. It's a single environment. It's what powers Google to be able to do what Google does, because if you go to Google, you don't see the museum of historical IT decisions silo by silo. You go to a Google data center, and it's all the same. It's just a sea of x86 boxes that are dynamically configured based on their own proprietary technology that they've developed and their own you know, distributed operating system, so to speak. What we're trying to do is bring that same capability to every business to have that luxury. So homogeneity is definitely an advantage that the Googles and, and Amazons of the world have, and I think you guys have, have noticed that, you've observed that, and, and now you're marching down that, that path. We heard today we're 25% in 2008, virtualized applications, 60% today. Yep. The goal, the gauntlet that, that Gelsinger threw down was let's get to 90%. I'm, I'm reminded it. Rick of a mountain climber, you know? He or she's <laughs> at the, you know, they can see the top and it's getting, it's, this is the really hard part. It's that called you the false summit. Yeah, 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 the false summit. But you're motivated, right? You know, have yeah, now absolutely. you have more resources. So the homogeneity of, of you and your ecosystem, but you've got other you know, virtualized systems out there as well that are starting to gain ground. So, so this is what makes it challenging for you guys. So, so how do you get to that you know, final summit and, uh, yeah. and, and keep it all at that 80% <laughs> VMware? Well, I, <laughs> first marketing. off, I believe the industry will move towards 90% plus virtualized. It's, it's inevitable because there is nothing holding us back VMware from doing or otherwise, that. You're saying, VMware yeah. or otherwise. So we as an industry will move in that direction. Now, how does VMware continue to uh, maintain such strong market share? Well, that's the challenge that we have to continue to innovate every single year to put out the kind of capability and the technology that matches to the vision that we're portraying with the software-defined data. That center. cadence that Pat Gelsinger it talked about. Takes talk. Time waits for no man. He knows that cadence well from the, uh, the cadence of Moore's Law. Right? That's right. I mean, I see you guys making some great moves on the street here in the tech industry. And this year, a billion dollar acquisition that lays the groundwork for the software-defined data center, which we believe is part of this modern era. Mm -hmm. uh, with Hadoop, you're seeing modern era and a lot different than Linux. So new capabilities doesn't mean it's the direct replica. So you know, we, we always talk about that as well on our blog. But one area that we're really following deeply right now, Rick, I want to just touch on as a point, maybe get your comment on if you can, is low level virtual machines. And this really talks to some of the work in from the computer science area where at the program level, the virtualization has yet to tap into these large data centers on the on the on the metal bare metal commodity gear like Google's and these guys who were running this. So having the ability to run these low level virtual machines with the programs, not just the products, is a big trend. And University of Cali University of uh, uh, Illinois is doing some cutting edge work in the area. But this brings up the developer community, right? You guys mm -hmm. had acquired Spring two years ago. Um, the developer community is evolving really, really fast. You're making moves just just join OpenStack. How do you keep up with the developer focus, and what is that focus um, for you guys? Are you enabling um, with this abstraction? I see you're, re you're reducing the complexity, so you're enabling you're enabling infrastructure. Can you talk about that? Because that's something that people want to know about. Is I'm a developer. I see I see vCloud, Cloud Foundry, a lot of stuffs out there. What's the what's the core message to the developer community? Well, our belief for the developer is that developers should focus on application level business logic. The business depends on applications, the business has demands, and they want a, a process and an environment where the developers are responding to the business demand, not tweaking and tooling with the plumbing underneath. So our role is to create that open platform for development and Cloud Foundry is a great example of developer gets to choose the language and framework that they want, choose the a set of services that are enabled through the cloud that they need for their application, and choose where they want to deploy it, whether that's on VMware infrastructure or not. But it's a, it helps the developer focus on what is the business need of this application. It's our role as a company and as an infrastructure vendor to make sure that those applications are highly reliable, they can be operated extremely efficiently, and that they're easy to, to configure, deploy, and manage over time. So we want developers to focus on business value 
And as Paul is famous for saying, it's our job to make the plumbing disappear. Yeah. That's our role. I think that, you know, there was a quote on the Mercury, Mercury uh, News in San Jose. Um, Chris wrote a story called uh, about Twitter and how you know, group on Twitter, outside of, outside of LinkedIn, everyone in the social stocks is plummeting uh, or down. And he called it the summer of social media discontent. Really talking <laughs> about really that hype cycle where the emphasis, and this is something that we're, we, we're talking about and I want to drill down on is this business value conversation. Because we're seeing an upswing of um, business value, not so much a bubble bursting, just that new uh, anti-hype, but more, hey, there's real business problems to be solved. Can you talk about uh, use cases that you're seeing, if you can give a little bit more color to that business value conversation? Is it software as a service? Is it platform as a service? What specifically can you tell developers sure. those use cases are? Sure, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of different examples out there. Certainly, platform as a service empowers a whole new set of developers that previously um, had tools and infrastructure dictated to them. With the move towards platform as a service, they have the opportunity to go choose what platform or again, what language or framework they want to use so that they can more rapidly develop an application uh, that's based on or that is a good fit for a particular language or what have you. So uh, mobile is a great example of that. If we had to wait for the traditional client server world to deliver all of our mobile apps, the uh, app store would be non-interesting <laughs> to say the least. So yeah, you know, yeah. we're empowering new types of application development. But I think in terms of business value, again, it goes to Every time we break down barriers, even as low as the infrastructure level, it creates new opportunities for businesses and how they operate. One of my favorite examples is Nicey Euronext, who built the first public financial cloud based on the VMware technology. Yep. And the notion is simply that today, or previously, the largest brokerage houses had actual servers on the floor, on the trading floor at Nicey Euronext. So they could pay millions of dollars to put their servers right there on the floor because the difference between four nanoseconds in a trade Matter. means you know, profit <laughs> or loss, right? So Sweet. only a few of the elite could do that. So what did NICE Euronext do? They reinvented their business model. They built a public cloud on their trading floor built on VMware technology that allows now other people to be able to host trading applications right there on the floor using a shared infrastructure close to the trading app. That's changing the dynamics of how trading is working and, and really opening up uh, the envelope to a much broader array of So businesses. if you're interested in the story at 3.40 today, we have Fergo O'Sullivan coming on, who They're is gonna be uh, on. head of global biz dev for, uh, or global partnerships for uh, NYSE Euronext. Fantastic, so, yeah, yeah. He's, he's it's a great, great story. Guy, so. Yeah, it's looking one of my favorites. That. All right, good. All okay, right. looks like we're out of time here, John. Uh, okay. Well, I have one more question um, to end it. Next year, we ask you this every year, <laughs> what's your agenda for the next 12 months to next, next uh, VMworld um, in terms of your charter for the year? What's your outlook and what are you looking to, na to nail down uh, with, with, with VMware and the marketing and the overall leadership? I think that we set the, the next 12 months fairly clear as the challenge is We've got 400,000 customers who have done an incredible amount with virtualization technology. They've put in place the foundation for that software-defined data center. Our challenge now is to work with them to accelerate that path, find that fast lane, if you will, to cloud computing, and really optimizing all their previous investments, but getting even further value out of a complete cloud computing environment that creates even more efficiency, especially around operating costs. And VMworld next year at Moscone again, right? VMworld at Moscone. You got it, you got it, yep. bought it up for a decade. I, right? th I think we did something like <laughs> Good that. Good job. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank okay, you we are here inside <laughs> theCUBE. The future is about uh, abstracting away the complexities, making it easier, new use cases, uh, re-engineering the business models, all using technology. Uh, VMware is building the new stack. Uh, Rick Jackson, CMO of VMware, thanks for coming on theCUBE. We'll be right back with our next guest after this break.